Um, good evening, and thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, this is experimental, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I only heard about this this morning uh, that I could uh, do this talk, and uh, I immediately thought, no, well, I have spoken about Twig, <laughs> I've spoken about dependency management problems, um, so I had already presented anything I had on the shelf, so I created this brand new presentation uh, this afternoon. Uh, well, I hope it's, it goes well. <laughs> if it doesn't, please be kind to me. And um, well, let's, let's make this something, uh, yeah, maybe friendly, maybe interactive. Uh, yeah. It's called Principles of PHP Package Design. And you could also remove the PHP from this title since these principles are, um, are correct for every kind of package within software land. Uh, so my name is Matthias Nobuck. I am a PHP developer and since a couple of weeks also a consultant. So um, I'm working for different companies telling them how they can build their applications with PHP and many times also with Symfony since that is my favorite framework. All right. Um, yeah, I also help people learn to uh, work in a test-driven way. I'm a big fan of test-driven development. I am also a big fan of clean code. And, um, well, draw these things on a paper and think about what else would he like. Um, well, I like Robert Martin in general. <laughs> so this is uh, Uncle Bob, um, uh, and uh, this guy, this man, is, uh, is a very famous uh, developer um, and consultant and trainer and writer. He has written, I think, two uh, well-known books. Uh, the first is called Clean Code, and the other is called uh, Agile Principles of Software Development. And um, there is a nice page on Uncle Bob or askuncleBob.com. Uh, it's linked here, <laughs> but you can't click it. It, is, um, it, is, uh, it contains two links to two, two articles about uh, package design principles. And I've, I find this a very interesting concept, um, something that many PHP de developers are not aware of, and I think they should be aware of, since nowadays uh, we have Composer, we have Packages, we have all the means to, uh, or uh, GitHub, of course, we have all the means to share our code with other people. And so uh, we should learn how to uh, write code that is shareable and that is reusable. Um, yeah. And even though uh, many, many of you won't contribute to open source software or won't contribute to open source country, um, yeah, it is still important to know how you should arrange your packages inside your project and uh, how you can make them reusable at least for yourself and within the same project. Right. Um, so we are, I think, very familiar with the idea of classes as a, uh, an organizational um, unit. Yeah, you put your code in classes normally, right? Um, when you zoom out a bit in your project, project and you take a look at the code in a more general way, you see packages. And packages are groups of classes. They belong together. You have a certain feeling about this. Uh, these classes belong together and these classes don't. The other classes should be in another package, so to say. And a package can be anything. Uh, many frameworks have different names for this. Uh, you can have bundles, you can have modules, uh, components, um, or even just plain packages. These are all the same. A package is just a way to bundle some classes together. And in a way, this is about comparing uh, the design of your code on, in a micro scale with uh, the design of your code on a macro scale. And even more macro would be to uh, compare applications with each other, but we are not going to do this today. Yeah, <laughs> there is this nice um, badge, so to say. About, um, yeah, it, it does not have anything to do with uh, the contents of my presentation. Uh, it's just that <laughs> I want you to, uh, to see SF which stands for symphony every time, <laughs> every once in a while, <laughs> so that maybe you are going to use components of it. Maybe. Salesforce? <laughs> 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 uh, 
And also, I have no, or almost no images uh, in the slides, oh. because this was just, uh, <laughs> just made a couple of, couple of hours ago. So um, sometimes you will see these nice colors, so your eyes can change contexts a bit every once in a while. Yeah, so the first par part is about principles of class design, and uh, I want to step uh, a little bit deeper into your code, or our code, and uh, take a look at the principles that uh, govern your code at the class level. And these are very famous principles. They are called solid principles. And I want to briefly um, go over them and see what you know of them uh, so that we can later reapply them to a package design. So the first one is the single responsibility principle. And it already says here what it is somewhat. A class should have one and only one reason to change. So um, a class does not need to have one responsibility. Uh, there should be just a, one reason to change the class. For instance, when something conceptually becomes different about this class, or you change implementation details uh, when it comes to saving things, or you can think of anything. Um, Still, responsibility is a, is, a, is, a, is a difficult concept. When I talk um, to people about this, um, we always discuss about where, where are the boundaries between a single responsibility and multiple responsibilities. So, and this, this more or less uh, applies also to a package design, since packages sh should also have mm, yeah, more or less one responsibility or one reason to change. Um, but yeah, in, in your daily job, there will be many more reasons than just one to change a package. But we'll discuss this in a while. Well, the second principle is the open-closed principle, the O of solid. And this says you should be able to extend a class's behavior without modifying it. Um, we will see later that there is also a, th a principle related to closure or openness when it comes to packages. But this is already on a class level very important. You, you should not, not need to open a class and modify code when uh, uh, this, uh, this change relates to something that is not related to the class, right? So when it comes to, um, say you have a class that uh, handles some uh, storing and you want to switch between uh, your storage engine uh, maybe you you start you started out writing MySQL underscore query etc., and now you want to use PDO. This should not be a reason to change all the classes that store uh, something. There should already be something uh, behind you storing something and the thing storing the data itself. Right. The third principle is called Liskov substitution principle. I don't even know where this comes from. Where this comes from? This Lis Liskov name. Uh, but the principle is derived classes must be substitutable for the base classes. And this means that in a hierarchy of classes, there are, um, you, should trust, you should be able to trust the interface of these classes. Um, and whenever two classes implement the same interface, you should be able to, to exchange them without any problems. So they should um, have the same contracts. They should return the same things, and they should take the same things. Then the I of solid. Uh, this is the interface segregation principle. Make fine-grained interfaces that are client-specific. Uh, this means that your interfaces, uh, if they are interface real interfaces within PHP, um, that they should not have too, um, too many methods, or um, more specifically, too many methods related, related to different things. So you have to try to keep your interfaces clean um, and make sure that the methods are about the same thing. And this, this principle is also applicable to uh, package, packages, package design, as we will see later. Dependency inversion principle depend on abstractions, not on concretions. And this, this is most obvious when you have uh, constructor arguments, for instance, and you uh, um, want to type in these arguments, and you say uh, a class, and then the, the argument name, this should not be class, but interface, to indicate that uh, you allow any class that implements the same interface to be exchanged by the one uh, you thought you were to get. Um, right. 
So we have now solid, right? Five principles. Are there any questions about these before we continue? Yeah? Can I, uh, just, to, just to clarify, um, you've got those five principles. Are they all properly independent? Independent. Because like, yeah. I, I just look at them and I, I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I've seen the solid presentation before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you've got dependency inversion. And, you know, I'm thinking, doesn't that overlap with some of the others? I can't quite work it out in my head immediately. But do you, do you in your mind, are they all mm -hmm. clearly distinct? Uh, um, well, uh, let me repeat the, the question. Uh, you ask whether or not these principles uh, have uh, much overlap between them. Yeah. And um, they are, maybe they are re related to each other. And uh, the question is also, do I have them clearly separated in my mind? Um, that's a good one. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure about my mind. <laughs> okay, I mean, just to give you a bit of background, mm -hmm. my, you know, my expertise is not so much around programming. And, I mean, I've done programming and I did mm -hmm. object oriented for a couple of years. But I, I'm a more of a DBA, and you know, every DBA will tell you, every DBA is honest, will tell you that ACID, there's an awful lot mm -hmm. of overlap between the A, the C, and the mm -hmm. I, and the D. They're, you know, it's a nice acronym, mm -hmm. um, but you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, if you really think about it hard, you think ACID doesn't quite make sense, but it's, you know, it's good mm -hmm. because it sort of gives the general flavor. Right. But I was just wondering if the same thing goes for solid, which, you know, and I, you know, I, you know, it's, yeah, it's not my area of expertise. I understand the right frame ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, the question is: um, Is solid not just another acronym? Uh, uh, it sounds nice, but does it really mean those important? It wasn't uh, quite that brutal. I mean, yeah. does it, are they actually distinct <laughs> concepts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, are these distinct concepts? Um, le let me ask this to you: uh, Do you think that there is um, too much overlap to be uh, distinct concepts? That is. Anybody uh, have distinct them? concepts can have overlap yeah. just because they're <coughs> they're about one thing, the concepts themselves, but of course the the implementations of one concept can apply to another. Mm -hmm. Don't think one <coughs> excludes the other, so yeah, they can. Right, right. Also, I think that um, um, there are many situations that are alike or that uh, uh, pose you. Th the, the same problems, but they require different principles to um, generate your own uh, guidance from. So, um, yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I will have to uh, try this in practice. <laughs> so. Right. Ah, there are some colors for you. Same yeah, again. <laughs> Or Zend, or Cake, or... <laughs> right. So then, two principles of package design. We uh, take a step higher and we take a look at aggregates of classes and which, principle, uh, which principles they should adhere to, or at least their design should adhere to. Um, this is very much uh, borrowed from the Robert Martin uh, articles. So. If you, if you think um, that I thought these, or that I invented them myself, no, that, that is not true. So, uh, there are two categories of package design principles. And the first, uh, one, uh, the first set is about cohesion. And cohesion. Cohesion is something you will know from uh, class design too. Uh, cohesion is something you can see when uh, a class has many methods, uh, but maybe the first two methods are related to the same thing and the other two methods are related to an entirely different thing. And so cohesion is low. Cohesion is about being about the same thing or being conceptually one. And the second set of principles is about coupling. And coupling, you may also know from your class design, coupling is whenever your class uh, relates to another class or uses another object of a certain class or, in or interface and you thereby effectively have coupled this class to the other class. And you can also couple packages. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we will take a look at these principles later. Ha, more colors. Um, <laughs> the same colors, actually. So first, the cohesion principles. And the first principle is called the release, reuse, equivalency principle. Um, 
and Robert Martin says it like this, the granule of reuse is the granule of release. So every time you want to reuse your code uh, as a package, you also uh, are responsible for releasing this code. And there is a lot to it. You cannot just say, I am going to reuse this code. There are many rules you have to apply for. Uh, since whenever you say I'm, you are going to reuse your code as a package, your package becomes a sort of a product. So you have to take care of its appearance to the outside world. You have to take care of its life cycle very much. And this is a quick list of things that came to my mind um, when I thought about this release re reuse equivalency principle. So whenever I'm going to reuse code, I'm going to release code. And these are the things I need to think about. So first of all, your code needs to be under some kind of version control. You cannot reuse your code uh, by just copy and pasting it into your email and sending it to your colleague and asking him to paste this into his project. This is, you can do this <laughs> and he will reuse it. <laughs> but you, you should be responsible. <laughs> you should behave responsibly. Uh, so version control, um, yeah, I don't think uh, many people won't use version control for reusing their code. But however, this is an important uh, thing. Then your code needs a package definition. Uh, if you're going to release your code on uh, GitHub as open source software, or on any, any other platform, that is, um, you need some definition for your code. Your code needs to have a label. It, has, it needs to have a name. To be, to be able to distinguish it from other packages out there. Uh, so it needs to have a namespace. And uh, it needs to have a description of all its dependencies, uh, any package it needs. Uh, it needs to have a description uh, containing your name and your, a way to contact you, if it's email or Twitter or I don't know. Uh, since whenever things may be wrong with it, they need to be able to contact you. If it's you, uh, or sorry, if it's a colleague, or if it's another developer you don't know, it should be equally, uh, equally well possible to contact you. Um, it needs to be hosted somewhere where people can retrieve it. Uh, this sounds very obvious, but it isn't. Uh, many um, companies have internal hosting somewhere, uh, and then you need to think about: are, Am I going to host my code somewhere else, or? Uh, just internally, and then, but then also I'm going to reuse it internally. And other colleagues must be able to access this repository. Um, Autoloading is very important. Your package must be installable with just a single command, and then you, uh, your users should be able to, to use the code you wrote. Um, yeah, again, this seems pretty obvious, but there are many examples out there uh, of packages that uh, have their own autoloader or I don't comply to any existing standard. Uh, BC, before Christ, or backwards compatibility, <laughs> is very important. Uh, of course, uh, once you release your code to be re reused, uh, it needs to have some kind of compatibility strategy. So you need to think about, uh, am I going to take care of backwards compatibility? Am I going to take care of forwards compatibility? Um, any of that? Or uh, do I choose this? Um, package to be uh, just the master branch and uh, uh, the unstable uh, code. Um, yeah, you can choose to do that, but you need to be clear about this. Then you need to mark any breaks when it comes to compatibility. When, you are, when you choose to change your API in a very uh, big way, you need to um, uh, keep a document with all these changes. and. Um, yeah, uh, maybe also add branches to your repository so that people can check out one branch that is still something they uh, can use in their project. Yeah, uh, rela related to this is uh, semantic versioning, of course. You need, you need to have a versions tags um, that make sense. Uh, so everything below 1.0 is um, uh, unstable, and then it becomes stable, and you can choose your own um, um, moments in time when you uh, um, add fixes or maybe major version updates. Yeah, this, this again is something you need to take care of. Um, these are, uh, yeah, I, I didn't mention this. These are principles. Um, 
things that you should keep in mind while you're developing packages, while you're de developing code that should be reusable. Um, so there's not really a best way to do all these things, but you need to think about them and you need to, you need to, you need to be conscious about them. Yeah, uh, well, tags um, is related to versions, of course. Um, then there are some files that should be there in each package that you release, not just your code, but um, a short readme file with some information about how people could use it. Um, yeah, many of, of these little files, like a license and a change log, and well, um, any, any other files you could think of? Some sort of documentation of files? Documentation, right? right. Mm -hmm. So the readme points to a place where there is more to read about your code. More contagious documentation. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, a disclaimer. <laughs> a license, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right. There are many problems in open source land uh, right now when it comes to licenses and coding yeah. standards. Coding standards is a yeah, contributing, uh, contributing, <laughs> abusing, con contributing, yeah. Um, yeah, again, there is no um, need to add these files, all these files, since maybe you don't intend uh, your package to be used like it. But you need to be constantly thinking about this. This is going to be a product. People are going to use it. You need to be kind to them. Another important thing, many code out there is not tested. Uh, again, this can be a choice, but um, maybe a bad choice, I think. Um, there are many good ways to uh, to add some quality control to your project. And there are also many nice ways to show your users uh, the quality of your package with, um, well, you, you, you all know them with little badges indicating uh, the amount of code coverage, um, the, um, the, uh, whether or not the build has succeeded. Um, these are all very nice things to add to your project and they, they add uh, a very good feeling about a package. Or a very bad feeling if the build keep, uh, keeps failing, of course. Yeah. I wrote down some examples of packages that are not good, in my opinion. Uh, well, <laughs> um, the thing is, they are good, <laughs> but they don't adhere to these principles. Um, uh, so it seems like the authors don't know them or don't know how to apply them. Or don't care. Or don't care. <laughs> right. So there's one thing, the, um, uh, there is a, a charge B. Well, I didn't really work with it myself, but I, I took a look at it. And it is some kind of a payment API. Um, it has a composer.json file, so it looks like it adheres to this release principle. But um, this composer.json is, is entirely irrelevant. And it contains no information about uh, uh, for composer to, to load the, the classes. So you still have to auto load them yourself or load them yourselves. Uh, HTML Purify, last time I, I looked at it, it had um, still some yeah, old auto-loading mechanism that should be used instead of an automatic one. Um, and Codeception, which I tried uh, yesterday. Uh, it has a Silex module and also a composer JSON file, but it is not hosted on packagist.org. So um, it has its own hosting. Uh, version control hosting, uh, but but the hosting is GitHub itself, so I don't know why there is no package for it. Or well, yeah, that's just that's just strange. The, um, the common closure principle <laughs> is the second the second cohesion principle. Uh, it says that classes that change together should be packaged together, or are packaged together. And um, what this means is that um, uh, you should. Uh, Try to think of situations where you should change your code and uh, ask yourself, would this affect the, the entire package? Uh, and so uh, an interesting question is always, uh, if I train, change my entire web framework, um, would I have to uh, change anything inside this package? And I think when you, for instance, develop a bundles for Symfony, which is done often in a very bad way, uh, this question yeah, uh, it is a very painful one, since many of your bundles will change when the framework changes, right? Uh, when uh, a framework suddenly doesn't support bundles anymore, or doesn't support uh, 
um, a, a given request class or a response class or maybe. Um, yeah, then you will have a problem with your package. And um, well, this is, this is the, first, the first gesture towards um, splitting up these packages. So anything that is related to the framework uh, should be in another package than everything that is related to your business problem. Right, again, maybe common knowledge, but this goes wrong too many times. Um, yeah, the same, the same for persistence libraries. Uh, if you use uh, Doctrine or, or Propel, and um, uh, one day you, you switch between these two, how many packages uh, would you have to change? And I would say that maybe one package, maybe two in your entire project. Um, yeah, but there are too many packages that are too tightly coupled to the persistence library. Yeah, and um, well, many times a good reason for a package to change is a change in feature uh, requests or a change in business rules. So these are very le legitimate uh, changes. Uh, oh, again, um, think about this also in terms of uh, the, the open-close principle. It is very much related to this, but then on, on a higher level, um, where the open-close principle was about not opening your class to change code in it uh, because of certain changes. This is the same thing for packages. Do you think sometimes it's OK to uh, couple your code a little bit more tightly around your framework? Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to write your app in a way so that it can be used with any other framework, mm -hmm. you're going to write <coughs> a lot of boilerplate code and not going to utilize what your framework is for, you know, not yeah. writing that. So isn't it OK to boil a little bit or bolt a little bit onto your framework there, uh -huh. just to save time? Yeah, that's right. Um, just to repeat the question, um, is it always uh, uh, important to, to make this separation so uh, clean or clear uh, between framework code and your own code? Uh, is it not OK to couple these, these things, especially when you're writing a product, of course, uh, which is just a once-in-a-lifetime used um, piece of code? Um, yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, uh, I will come to the back to this later. Uh, but generally, when you are going to reuse code, um, this is an important thing. And again, there are too many packages that contain uh, too many specific information about, for instance, their uh, storage framework. Uh, right. Can I add something to that? Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you have packages, they only rely on a couple of things like <coughs> either user input or some kind of session data mm. or request data and not the entire framework. So it's easy to write interfaces for that mm. and just uh, remove the type coupling there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the suggestion is to use interfaces to remove coupling in this case. Yeah, and that's, that's a very good one. There are many other ways, um, including the use of uh, event listeners to uh, to set all these request specific data. Um, yeah, uh, some examples of uh, packages that that violate the common closure principle. Um, the false user bundle. M maybe you use it. Uh, maybe you know it. It is a bundle for Symfony applications. Um, yeah, which provides some information about uh, or some functionality around user management. Uh, users can register, they can log in, they can log out, etc. Um, yeah, but it, it has too much library code, so to say. Uh, so there is too much code that is not related to Symfony at all. So it could have easily been inside a false user library. And um, yeah, uh, another good example is a false rest bundle. And uh, yeah, it, it is tightly coupled to um, the ser serializer bundle. And uh, yeah, maybe, um, yeah, the, the rest bundle uh, has uh, tools for uh, creating rest web services, web services with a symphony. And the serializer bundle, yeah, contains code to link the JMS serializer to a symphony application. Um, but these two are very much related. So if anything changes in the serializer API, the false rest bundle has to change too. And uh, uh, these, these two uh, keep running after each other. So uh, first one has to make a change, then the other. And 
uh, yeah, this, this is very difficult to work with, uh, as many users may have experienced. Um, so any big changes should be made together as a decision about a uh, future API. And this is a dangerous thing when you develop a package. You should always have some sort of a stable um, common ground. So I think in this case, the serializer should have been rather only the interface itself. Um, and it should have a package just for itself. But later, ab uh, more about stable packages. Uh, the common reuse principle. Classes that are used together are packaged together. And this means that um, if you use any class inside a given package, you are likely to, to use uh, all the other classes inside the same package. And this also means that whenever you use a class inside a package and don't use many other classes inside the same package, this package is not separated well. So um, this is something you see many times. Um, there is, for instance, uh, a routing package. And it contains everything related to routing in any way. But uh, as it happens, there are uh, several um, uh, things you can do with this routing package, um, which are entirely unrelated to each other. Although <laughs> they are all about routing, but uh, they, should not be, they should not be used together. They can be used separately. So then this is a clue. This is um, a reason for you to, uh, to change this package, to split this package into multiple packages. Many good examples <laughs> out there. Um, again, false rest bundle, it has a small sub package. It's called query param fetcher. <laughs> Maybe anybody uses this. Uh, I think it's very good, but uh, it should be used separately. It should not be used as part of false rest. Uh, uh, monologue, um, maybe, yeah, maybe it's good to ask how many people would know these things <laughs> before I keep talking about, yeah, monologue, right? This is a library um, to log messages to a file or anything else. Um, it's pretty good, but it contains many handlers, uh, and handlers are specific implementations of um, handlers, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so when I have a log message, um, I want maybe to put it in a file, but I also may want to put it in a database or send it to some other server. And all these specific handlers are part of the big monologue package. Uh, this is not a good idea, since uh, many people won't use all the classes in inside this same package. Uh, the same goes for aesthetic. It has many filters. Yeah, m most people won't use all these filters, maybe one or two. Yeah, and, and another bundle, which is not, uh, uh, yeah, I, right? Uh, some uh, some questions? You were the first writer. So yeah. you say the monologue has all the handlers packaged in the same package, mm -hmm. but if you put them outside of the package, in that case, <coughs> those handlers, they will depend on the uh, monologue itself. Yeah. And in that case, it will Yeah, it is quite good, yeah. Um, but the problem is, and this is something I will discuss later um, when it comes to um, stability uh, of, of packages, Monolog by itself as a package has many dependencies uh, which you don't need. Uh, although these are optional, um, yeah, they are dependencies. So uh, when anything changes, um, say you have, uh, this is uh, called the, um, the gray log handler. This is, uh, um, um, or maybe not gray log, but log stash or something. Uh, right. <laughs> um, so um, this handler has a dependency on a specific library, uh, gray log no, something library. Um, and whenever something changes inside that library, the handler has to change too. And this means the whole monologue package has to change. And so when you update your monologue package, when you only, only use the monologue package in your project, you get an, an entire new uh, package, although uh, it is a new version and you won't notice any problems with it, but you still need to uh, update. And even if the monologue package has a change you want, but this change has nothing to do with the, the, the change in the handlers, you still need to upgrade the entire monologue package um, and re receive also the changes made for something you don't use. And this is not a very big problem in PHP land, but it is in other lands. lands. <laughs> 
uh, language lands where um, you have to compile your program again and again and again, and it gets bigger or right so there are you, c you could add some question marks here <laughs> whether it's that important um, yeah for, for me one reason why monologue shouldn't separate that mm -hmm. monologue it, uh, itself if you remove every handler mm -hmm. it will render the entire package <coughs> useless so the package itself will uh, not be able, will not be able to be responsible for what it wants to be responsible of mm -hmm. so then it's responsible for nothing so well, that's not right. entirely true but this because monolog itself is responsible for handling your message how it handles your message is an entirely different question it handles your message and it does it very well yeah. except this message. is this is except yeah. but yeah. then it yeah that's uh, so Okay, it accepts, but yeah, it doesn't yeah. handle. If it, it, it doesn't it have a handler, handler. If, if, if handlers are removed, how can it handle? But the handling isn't. Uh, how do you call it? The handling isn't its responsibility. Uh, exactly. Accepting mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps, perhaps changing it in some way. Or, or uh, let, let, let me repeat this. Um, so uh, this question started with um, the idea that when you take out all the handlers from the monologue package. The monologue package itself will be useless, right? Um, in a way. <laughs> so uh, a monologue, um, as you said, uh, um, has a very specific responsibility. It accepts messages or requests to log messages. And the handler does the real work of handling this request. Um, also, uh, the, another responsibility of monologue is now being a stable interface for this, a stable package. Uh, on which other uh, packages can rely very much. Uh, so, write another question. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if this basically goes off into coupling, right? Because with each of these things, you've got monologue, ascetic, and uh, the other one, they're all things that you could say, take the listeners out, take the filters out, take the handlers out, but then you have a dependency on the interface then, because you have, don't you then have to create an interface that all the handlers would need the same way with filters and the same way with listeners. So you're creating dependency on a certain type of interface. So your coupling is only going to work with that interface. So if you describe your interface in monologue, or where are you going to describe it? You see what I mean? No, I don't. I There's a dependency in your coupling. Then. If you take the handlers out, right? So you said, OK, monologue is sending off a log. It's going to go to a database. OK, it's going to go to a file, right? Maybe it's just an email. Mm -hmm. So each of those are going to handle that. You're going to have to have a certain type of interface that you're depending on. If you write your interface in a certain way, you know, if it's just basically a CRUD interface or whatever it is, every other handler has to meet that same type of interface, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah. So um, the question is, uh, or. Uh, it's more of another principle, isn't it? That yeah. If you're using this principle, you have to have interfaces predefined mm -hmm. or defined ahead of time. Yeah. So what the situation is basically is you're not bundling handlers of the monolith, but what you are bundling with it is the interface of the handler. That's yeah. That is right. Bundling. Yeah. And this is something I I, I will show you later. Um, the the best solution in this situation is indeed to add the interface you expect, as in the the PHP interface, um, to the monolog package, so that other packages can see what the what they were supposed to do. Otherwise, indeed, uh, all the handlers wouldn't wouldn't even be useful with monologue. Yeah. All right. Yep. That case, oh, sorry. Yeah. That case it, uh, interferes with your previous principle, which uh, says that the package shouldn't uh, depend on another package. And if you have interface in, say, in that monologue package, mm -hmm. and all handlers depend on that interface, they already depend on the monologue package. Ah, uh, well. Um, my my principle or the principle doesn't say you should not depend on other packages. Um, it's um, this is related to the the coupling principles which will follow uh, in in some minutes. Um, you need to depend on stable packages. This is what the next principle says, and um, a, a stable package a stable package is also a package that is abstract. This is something we will, we will see later. Uh, so actually, the monologue package being a package containing very abstract things, uh, almost unusable things, will make it a very stable package, uh, which others can easily rely on. 
with no big problems or um, chances that things will change very often. Yeah. All right. Well, my question relates really, really very much to the previous one. Mm -hmm. How would you, uh, uh, would the monologue composer JSON file look like if they're all the handlers are separated? Mm -hmm. Would you, you need at least, at least one to, uh, handler to use the monologue <coughs> package? Um, no, uh, the, the way, um, the, the question is... Uh, you expect something happens with your messages. Yeah. Yeah. There's some handler that will pick it up. Uh -huh. But if there's no handler, will it be really a problem? Or is it just, or you know, yeah. Monlock's yeah. done, mm -hmm. and you just don't have a message anymore. Yeah, but That's your problem. Yeah, but yeah. it's not... So it's your, your, <laughs> your decision <laughs> to install <laughs> handler. I'm All right. going to use monologue when I uh, want to log... Uh, log. Uh -huh. Stuff, whatever, it, whatever it accepts. <laughs> but that's that's but difference in like is I know, it a I know, concept or is it yeah, a real life thing? But it's, it's more like a recipe where uh, you <coughs> need this ingredient <coughs> and you also need the other ingredient to bind together. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. I use an ORM, yeah. but I don't bind the database to it. Yeah, you, s you put it in your ORM, but it doesn't save to anything. Mm -hmm. But you magically wrote, written right. uh, a record somewhere. You see, you I see... Mean, it's completely useless. <laughs> <useful. laughs> well, I mean, it's on a certain level, yeah, I agree. But yeah, the whole reason why monologue is built this way is for ease of use. <laughs> I mean, it's ease of use. That's it. No, th <laughs> this is the reason why I, I talk about these things. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are very bad ideas about um, design principles or uh, the way you should design packages. Uh, well, think about this. Uh, monologue being uh, easy to use for everybody isn't that a big problem in itself? You know, um, uh, maybe there are. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Talking too long, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so if there were a hundred or thousand maybe ways to handle log messages, should it add all these ways to its its own package? No, of course not. Um, again, uh, you should make as a developer a choice about the handlers yourself. Which handler do you want? Add the, add the handler package as a dependency to, to your project, and the handler will automatically also load monolog for it. Or maybe add monolog yourself since you want to, to use it. Right. Uh, what about frameworks then? Is it uh, a crime that they are bundling uh, MySQL drivers, MSSQL drivers, mm -hmm. uh, Postgres, what, what have you? Is it a crime <laughs> that they bundle all those implementation details with their framework? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is, it is a big crime. This yeah, is yeah. Frameworks should be useless in concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the, there are some um, uh, questions about this now and then. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, the question is, uh, yeah, I don't like all these packages uh, uh, listed in my composer file. Uh, why don't we put them together more? Or, um, yeah, it's exactly be because of this. We need stable, reusable packages. Uh, they need to be clean. They need to be maintainable. Um, and the thing is, though, if, I, if you allow mm -hmm. me, how useful is, uh, for instance, a cake PHP MySQL driver uh -huh. to anything else? Mm -hmm. Why not just bundle it with that repository? Mm -hmm. Uh, because it, it is, um, it has to do with the uh, with the, the um, direction of stability. We will also look at this later. Um, yeah, the main package containing all the database-specific uh, things or the, the driver-specific things, uh, it becomes instable because this package has all the real dependencies the that every driver has. Isn't the folder by itself a package? They're separated in separate folders, so aren't they? Ah. You see them as a folder. Um, no. Not necessarily. <laughs> no. no. But I, I think, uh, let me continue, so, so we can make some, <laughs> so we can make things a little bit clearer, and we have uh, some other concepts we can use in the, the discussion. Since, um, well, th this is done, um, well, I think wrong in many ways uh, currently. Um, so, a lot of change has to come when it comes to package design. Colors. <sighs> <laughs> this is good for your mind. So, <laughs> so let, let it, let it arrive. Uh, then, uh, coupling principles. Those are the second half, or the second part of the principles. There is this rule, or a principle, the acyclic dependencies principle, which says that the dependency graph of packages must have no cycles. And since this is very obvious, I think, to many people, probably in this room, uh, Can you say that slowly again, because that wasn't obvious to me. Ah, right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you mentioned 
Um, yeah. Acyclic dependencies, and I'm already, my mind's going. Bzzz. Right, um, all right, sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's in here, no cycles, which is acyclic. Uh, so <laughs> we see here um, a graph. That means it just basically should flow top to bottom, it shouldn't yeah. get back up. Yeah, okay, yeah. Got it. Uh, it, it will give you many problems <laughs> when uh, something down here uh, requires something up here. And then uh, either this dependency graph or um, the dependency, how would you say that? Um, well, in fact, any package manager who would try to, to find this out would not succeed. Uh, or if you would force uh, these packages to be installed separately while they are being dependent, you will have the same problem as mentioned earlier, that when one package changes, um, the other package, package will also change. And then you don't know which one was first or should be released first. They should be released together at the, at the exact same time. So this is a, a big problem. Not so much. Sorry. That is how KPHP would solve the problem of those cycles. Uh huh. And, or dependency hell, like they're all depending on different versions that are not. Yeah. So uh, yeah, in in practice, you can solve this by uh, installing them one by one. Right, and maybe first analyze everything that is in this dependency graph, and then uh, recognize cycles. But but don't install them as cycles, but install them one by one. As a package designer, mm -hmm. you don't know what the application will need of all the mm -hmm. components, so you will never know where all the cycles will happen. Right, but you can when you, whenever you um, uh, create a package and release a package, you can make sure that um, uh, your dependencies are uh, known to you, and you can find out whether or not there are any cycles. So this is not a, a um, uh, not so much a responsibility for you, as well as for um, maybe the project uh, uh, designer or maybe the architect of the project. It should be um, this. Should, uh, this is something that should be checked uh, when you are having a project mm -hmm. with dependencies. Whether or not this is the best way to check this is uh, a question I have myself too. Um, I only made this up uh, today, <laughs> yesterday. No, um, Composer is of course just one way to look at packages uh, and packages also. So there is some room for discussion here. But yep. Yeah, because these are principles to design packages, right? Mm -hmm. And you're placing this responsibility in the hands of the project owner, right? Well, the project's developer lead. It yeah, needs to be aware that yeah. it can happen. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't the project owner just run? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, you've got this composer lock, or you've got an NPM. You've got the. Mm -hmm. I I forgot how it's called, but you can freeze uh, dependency trees. It will mm -hmm. traverse through dependency, dependency, dependency. Mm -hmm. Just recursively store all the uh, version numbers, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you can never get an A B B C C uh, B conflict. Mm -hmm. Uh, why wouldn't you, as a project owner, just run that, and then mm -hmm. all your dependencies are met? Yeah, yeah. This this is uh, somewhat the same solution as discussed earlier. You could uh, you could force this. You could say just <laughs> don't worry about all these real dependencies. Uh, just install them, and they will work. I guarantee you. But the problem is, uh, especially when uh, upgrading your packages, and um, not only in, in practice when you are working with Composer, but especially when you are developing on both packages at the same time and you change the API uh, on one side and, and on the other side. So where do you start? Uh, you, you upgrade one and you release a new version and then, well, there's a big problem with that. And in JavaScript, you can have several versions of the same software and they will run next to each other, but right. in PHP, mm -hmm. you get naming conflicts, mm -hmm. so the language yeah, just yeah. doesn't allow you to do it in that way. Yeah, once right. the class is loaded, you cannot unload it or <laughs> replace it. You can, you just get a fatal error. Ah, <laughs> yeah. All right, but there's more to this, of course. Um, there are also uh, packages that don't have a Composer JSON file inside most projects, uh, since you will create many packages for just that specific project. So you need to do some uh, work by hand here. You need to uh, take a look at the direction of dependency um, and whether or not there are cycles. Then the stable dependencies principle uh, depend in the d direction of stability. This is something I already mentioned uh, before. And um, stability equals here then um, not easy to change. 
Uh, so, um, and this is something we will see. A stable dependency is also a dependency with, um, with, with not many dependencies itself. So a stable dependency is, can work on its own, can stand on its own. And other packages may depend on it. Um, mm. Yeah, which makes, which makes them hard to change. When a package is being depended upon by other packages, uh, it has a responsibility to not, to not change too often, or all these other depending packages need to change also at that same time. Um, there is some calculation for this, uh, for stability. It works like this. Uh, dependencies between packages should be calculated by looking at classes from one package that need another class in another package. And um, then you have the, the number of classes that a package needs from another class. This is C out. And then there is the number of classes that another, packages, uh, another package uses from your own package. And that is C in. Uh, this is in desperate need of some drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I see now. <laughs> so, yeah. Sort of inched your way. I mean, is it clear when you do class design that you've got mm -hmm. seven dependencies in and 42 out? You don't know it yet, uh, how many dependencies there will be. Uh, this is something um, that can only this be... This is quite a theoretical yeah. sort of abstract yeah. sort of thing. Because I was just thinking, I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know how to count my dependencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is this right. for two packages? Because see how this calculatable, because you can... Mm -hmm. You know which yeah. packages you depend on, but you don't know yeah. which packages depend on you. So is well, this between two packages? Or? No, uh, between many packages. And um, yeah, that, that's that's very good. Uh, this is a calculation that sh can only be, be done in the context of a full application. So once you have all the packages in place, uh, you can start counting uh, the classes. Since indeed the um, the uh, C out can y you can calculate it, it uh, on its own. <laughs> Take a look at the class and calculate how many other classes or interfaces it uses. Uh, but C in is only relevant within another application, um, and you can see f within the entire application, and you can see which classes use the class, and then you take a note: uh, ah, the class that uses this class is from the package that one. This is a solvable problem, though. If you use Composer, the Composer doesn't do this now, but like Node Package Manager does. It looks at which other packages are dependent on. And Calculates that, so then you <coughs> package within packages, for example. Yeah. yeah. That was going to be my follow-up question. If you are the tools like Composer, which can actually just look at your project and say, you know, the answer is 7.2 or something, so they can actually yeah. do this calculation uh, for you. I don't yeah. think that's very really realistic because there can be thousand packages that depend on your package, but you will never use it. So mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, no, but the the thing, you yeah, back so still, <coughs> that won't affect this calculation. Yeah. That no, calculation true. will remain the same. But there is the. Yeah. Yeah. This calculation. Mm -hmm. You could, yeah. it's, it's, it's a finite, hard coded, which is mm -hmm. what I was thinking originally. Yeah. The value of this calculation is for you to decide which package you should depend on, right? Mm -hmm. So <coughs> it's also yeah. within the. Um, within an application, you can calculate this within packages. Mm -hmm. So not. Uh, between libraries or something, but within real PHP yeah. folders. Yeah, right. yeah. To be clear about this, um, the um, the uh, calculation of these. Right. Maybe maybe a break then. Um, no. We're halfway. Ah, oh, we're almost. We're almost done. Right. So this is about uh, classes in packages uh, and used by other cl uh, other uh, classes in other packages. Um, and then uh, there's another problem with, with this kind of calculation, that not all packages in your application are defined. As already mentioned, um, especially, of course, all the externally imported packages using Composer can be, uh, uh, can be seen as a package. But you have many packages inside your application which are not, yeah, not um, recognizable as a package. So I, I um, hereby like to propose the reintroduction of the add package Log log annotation, <laughs> which I would very much love for these kind of calculations, <coughs> and then I will create an <laughs> and then I will create a tool for that. Okay, then I can yeah <laughs> maybe yeah. So um, uh, yeah, no no no. The, um, the the i number is the the number of dependencies out uh, divided by the total number of dependencies in and out, um, and this means that for example, if you have only one dependency out. 
uh, no, sorry, if you have two dependencies out, uh, divided by no dependencies in, so nobody uses your class, um, uh, then uh, your uh, class is very, or, your, or your package is very, uh, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, is yeah. Very it is very dependent. Far, it's just one thing. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, nobody depends on it, it only depends on others. So it is very dependent, it, it has a value i of one, and therefore it is very instable, right? Uh, it depends on many things, so if any of these things changes, itself, uh, it, this class itself also changes. Uh, the opposite thing is uh, when um, you have no dependencies out, and you are only being dependent upon, and then you are, it's, uh, you, the class itself is very independent, and therefore it is stable. And of course, this number should be applied to the entire package. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But you just said don't you can you only calculate this for complete application. Yeah, per package. But don't you have to yeah. get into account like what it depends on itself, the stability of that package? Doesn't that have to come into the equation mm, somewhere? How many classes uh, okay, are I in have the same? This thing? package, and it's um, like. Uh, 1600 packages in and one out mm -hmm. and the one out uh, yeah the one out has a stability that is super unstable mm -hmm. which would uh, affect my package should be unstable as well that's right yeah. where, where do you start then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need to if, if, if each other. Yeah. This is the reason why you don't want cycles. Then the math. Oh, no, that, that's <laughs> that's an interesting. I, I didn't think about this. Uh, you're very right. There, um, there is something contagious about stability. So a, a very big instability yes, at the bottom <laughs> can be <laughs> 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 right. Okay, uh, it, it can Zero. bubble up right. very fast. Um, right. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, what this principle says is that once you have calculated for each package its stability, you can say that um, this stability should be um, uh, higher or the instability should be lower as long as you travel down the dependency graph. So you, can, you should only depend on packages that are itself stable or stabler. Um, yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to skip a few things uh, in order to uh, <laughs> finish this up. <laughs> <laughs> then there is uh, stable, like in uh, the, the, the number of uh, dependencies out versus the dependencies in. But there's also the stable abstractions principle. And this says that uh, the same amount of stability um, uh, or the amount of stability should be as high as the, uh, as the, as the amount of abstractness in the uh, package. And when you com come to think about this, uh, we already discussed the monologue package. If it were only to contain interfaces uh, or abstract classes, it would have a high abstractness. It would not be very usable, right? as we concluded. Uh, you, you would need some more concrete packages to use this abstract package and make it more concrete. And this is what, what this says. Um, there is another nice calculation for this. Uh, <laughs> The number of abstract classes divided by the number of all classes in a package uh, is the number of its stability. Again, from zero to one. And you can plot uh, every package on something like this. You may know uh, the graph like this from pdepend. You can, you can uh, export a, um, an image of class design, or, um, w which does the same, I think, uh, with um, an axis for abstraction and an axis for instability. Uh, which says that uh, as, as we are getting more abstract, we are, we are also getting more stable or less instable. And um, as we are getting more instable, we will also get less abstraction. So we will be more concrete. And this is fine. Uh, the idea is that you have to be along these lines. So uh, an equal uh, amount of stability with an equal amount of abstraction, will give a nice, uh, um, yeah, a nice package. But as soon as you get here, um, well, let's see what this is. This is a very stable, but very concrete. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, it, um, well, what does it mean? Very does stable. It doesn't depend on anything. Yeah. Nothing depends on it. It's super <laughs> tight, <laughs> in my book. Yeah, yeah. It's it very concrete. It does everything, <laughs> and it's very stable. It uh -huh. 
Yeah. yeah. That's bad. But it's, but it's not <laughs> reusable, right? <laughs> Um, and this is a very instable package, so it has many dependencies, um, but it is very abstract. Um, so that's monologue. That's, 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 <laughs> that's very, yeah. <laughs> no, I have to think about this some more, I guess. Um, yeah, the last thing uh, I would like to mention, there's much to say about this, is the rule of three. Um, it is from Facts and Fallacies of Software Engineering, a very famous book. Um, it is three times as difficult to build reusable components uh, as single-use components. And a reusable component should be tried out in three different applications before it will be sufficiently general to accept into a reuse library. Um, I think this is true, especially the first part is very interesting since I think there is, uh, are, are a lot of differences between um, project-specific code, uh, library code, uh, code that will be reused within the same company, code that will be reused as open source software. So, um, much to discuss. And, uh, yeah, skip, 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 skip. Oh, no, the, the cover of my book. <laughs> yeah, 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 very, very nice. <laughs> you are going to get one uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Raffle, yeah, raffle, raffle, raffle. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah.